Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Leslie. I'm alcoholic. What a great group. I just want to thank you for such a warm welcome. I travel a little bit for business and from time to time for AA, and I had the best host. Mark, thank you so much. for. I got to have a little glimpse of Seattle, and I prayed for rain. I have my tourist umbrella in my bag. (laughs) He said, we don't use umbrellas here. I'm like, but I have to use when I'm from the desert. So uh, welcome, welcome, and... uh, Welcome if you're new and you didn't introduce yourself, you're welcome here. And welcome if you're sitting here feeling uncomfortable because I've sat in that chair many times with some time in the program still feeling uncomfortable inside Alcoholics Anonymous. My sobriety date is November 5th, 1991. I was 22 on Tuesday and um, I don't want that date to change. So I always say, you know, my sobriety date is November 5th, 1991. Uh, My home group is Connect the Dots. We're a very active home group like this group. Um, You know you're in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous when you're there. If you're ever in Las Vegas, we meet on Monday nights and a couple of other times during the week, so everybody's welcome, maybe not all on the same day. But uh, my sponsor is Mary A. And, um, you know, one of the things that I know for sure that I'm an alcoholic is I had little control over the amount that I took. And once I stopped, started, I couldn't stop absolutely. And if you identify with that, you may be alcoholic too. I'll talk a little bit about what I was like, um, what happened and what I'm like now. You guys always hear um, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? Well, not tonight. So uh, <laughs> I, um, I was born and raised in Phoenix um, in a very blighted area. It's affectionately known as Murder Vale. And you see it on cops from time to time. And I'm the youngest and the only girl. Um, my parents uh, are Irish and German, so I always say I come from hardworking drunks. As long as you went to work every day, you weren't an alcoholic. That was the art stick in my family. And my family doesn't have anything to do um, with my alcoholism other than giving you guys a little background. I'm alcoholic by consumption, and I imagine you might be too. I... Um, I didn't want to be in that family. I was ashamed of where I grew up. I thought that it was a socioeconomic problem. I would tell people that I was from Scottsdale, Litchfield Park are really nice areas. And um, I felt that you often hear in Alcoholics Anonymous that I didn't fit in. I couldn't find my place. But right on the kitchen counter um, was my 100 proof self-esteem, which was that vodka bottle, right? I didn't have to look for it. I didn't have to hide from it. My folks drank, and I started drinking at a very young age. I started drinking at 12 years old, and um, I would drink at life from that time until I came into Alcoholics Anonymous at 29 um, because immediately I was pretty enough. I was smart enough. I was all those things. I came from a family that uh, my parents um, uh, were having things going on in our home that were well beyond our years. So I was very confused by that, and I didn't want other kids to come to our home. And so when I would drink and go out into life and, and fight like um, I grew up, we solved problems with fisticuffs. So sixth-grade girls were no problem compared with the boys that I was fighting with at home. But I just didn't want you to see the inside because I thought if you could see the inside, you could really see what I looked like. And I would start drinking blacked out right away. um, And all of a sudden, I didn't know where I lived anymore. I didn't know where my catechism teacher, Mrs. Flanagan, was. I didn't know the high school, the grade school, and everything else. And um, I started getting kicked out of school right away. And there was a teacher there. um, God bless her soul. Her name's Rosalie P. We've still been in touch over the years. And she said, you know, you've got a, um, a good mind, but you're not using it. Uh, why don't you go ahead and sit and take your SATs? And I thought, nobody in my family takes their SATs. We're in trade, and um, we we don't go to college. And so I did what everybody else does when they're going to take them. I went out and got really drunk. They were what they were, and um, the light 
light, we see the light. And um, I started to go to college thinking that I wasn't good enough. And I tell you what, right before I left, um, my dad was in the car business, and I had a 70 Cuda, if you're into cars. I wish I had that thing today, but um, I uh, got in a fight with one of my brothers, and, you know, it's still so hard to talk about even all those years later. Is uh, He wanted to take this car, and I didn't want him to take it, and uh, he punched me in the face, broke my nose, and uh, we had this terrible, terrible fight, and you know, nobody in my family said anything. So I thought, you know, you're not worth anything. One more time, just tamp it down with the alcohol. Get away to college, move out of Phoenix, and everything will be okay. And um, I started out at U of A, which is in Tucson, and I earned 12 credits because I didn't go to school. And I I just couldn't um, couldn't find my way. It was that, that yearning that we hear about. And... Um, my family told me that I had to come back to Phoenix and all of a sudden I was like, I had to do something different because everything I was trying to get away from was the family that I was living with. And I came back, buckled down and, um, graduated, um, from undergraduate. And I had a wonderful experience to, to go to a private graduate school. And I grew up in the neighborhood that I told you I did. And I thought, um, how can it be that good if they're going to let me in, right? And I um, didn't show up to a Christmas party. I was going to a foreign exchange program to one of my brother's houses, and I had a date, and everything else is more important. And I was in Mexico at the time, and I got a call. No one I was living with spoke any English, and my biological family didn't speak any Spanish, and they said, uh, you need to come back to Arizona your dad is ill. And so I, Houston was my entry point, and I said, um, you know, where, where's dad? My brother didn't know. I didn't know. And he said, uh, dad's in the morgue. And, you know, I, um, I had no emotion. I went to Continental Airlines, and I said, can I board first? Because I was so worried about how I looked. And my dad's, I was telling Mark and his friend this earlier today that, my dad's sister and aunt are both nuns. They take Catholicism very, very seriously. And I was drinking in front of that church, um, not considering how that alcohol affected my mom, any of my siblings, my dad's family. And, you know, that family wouldn't speak to me well into Alcoholics Anonymous due to my behavior at that funeral. And I just made a complete complete jerk out of myself. I'm, I just make a mess wherever I go. I've been told that over and over and over again. And, um, I was in my last semester of graduate school at the time and my mom's begging me, um, not to quit. And you know what? I have to quit. It's my last semester. I got to go. I have to go. And, you know, thank God that, uh, I didn't leave that program. You know, I work in that field today, but after that, while my colleagues were going on and getting jobs, I was unemployable. If you drink like I drink, you'd be unemployable too. And I uh, moved to St. Louis, which is where my dad was, because Phoenix is a problem. You guys know Phoenix is the problem. And I get there, and um, you know it's hot there, hot and humid. I think Phoenix is hot. It's like 100% humidity and 100 degrees, and you know, I'm drinking and driving. I've got a alcoholic car, a 280ZX by this point, which had second and fifth. So um, <laughs> you're jerking around like this, you know. And um, i got to be careful up here doing that. But, um, you know, uh, I live with my dad's brother, my uncle, and he said that exact phrase to me. He said, you make a mess wherever you go. And I knew that I had to leave that area before it snowed because I'm from the desert. I can't drive. I can barely drive in the rain. And um, off I went, making a mess wherever I go. He was right. He was absolutely right. And um, at the time, this was in uh, the late 80s, 87, 88-ish, and two of my brothers lived in Las Vegas. So I needed help with the car with the second and the fifth. So I get up there, and 
my brother's going to fix my car and I'm in heaven. I had never been to Las Vegas for any extended period of time and it's on because there's no last call. At the time, uh, MAD hadn't really taken effect, so you could still have the open container. They called them go cups. I thought, this place is heaven, you know? I got a job in the casino business, and at that time, as long as you could basically do your shift, I'd work in one casino, run over and have margaritas at lunch, because, you know, I got a strong work ethic. As long as I can still drink, I can, you know, I'm a great employee, and I, uh, I would drink like that. My my one brother's an electrician, and uh, he's married to a great gal. She'd cook breakfast for us and everything, and uh, I'd be drinking vodka. My brother would be drinking beer, and somebody else would be drinking. She'd say, do you guys see anything wrong with this picture? We saw nothing wrong with the picture, <laughs> right? She's just crabby in the morning or what have you. And, uh, you know, I uh, at the time I felt so bad about myself, I... I would always wear, I was very thin when I um, moved to Las Vegas, and the shorts would be too short, and the blouse would be too low, and that's all I thought I had going for me, was all that stuff, was everything on display. And um, so I'm out with the him du jour, who knows who, in that same car, uh, and drinking wild turkey and Everclear. And I... Uh, there's a place in Las Vegas called Blue Diamond. It's pretty developed now, but it's out, back then it was out in the middle of nowhere, and I'm in another fight, physical fight with a guy in my alcoholic outfit. It was March, and it was chilly. And um, I decide, because we're fighting, to get out of the car at a very high rate of speed. I was a passenger in my car. And so... Luckily, being that intoxicated, you just fall like Gumby, you know. Otherwise, I'm sure I would have been killed. There was an off-duty paramedic at the time, and um, they sent flight for life. And I broke both my legs. I had a head injury. And at that rate of speed and in that outfit, it's just like a fire burn. And you guys have heard the Richard Pryor story of the debriding of the burnt skin, right? So I don't know what's coming down the pike. So they call my brother I live with. He's my drinking buddy. How could he be upset? He's totally disgusted because I don't have health insurance just yet because I haven't been at the casino long enough. And, you know, when you do it to yourself, doctors have no sympathy, no insurance, and doing it to yourself, they don't want to hear about it. So they hook me up to some very good... um, Medication. I'm not a medication gal. I'm a regular juicer. And I uh, tell my brother, I said, well, you got to go to Frankie's and get me vodka. So I'm hooked up to all these machines, and they're dropping me in this Hubbard tank. Lance says, I can't go to Frankie's and get you vodka. Have you seen yourself? Even my drinking buddy's horrified, right? And I... Uh, I, I'm in my 20s at this point. I, I, I've been incapacitated. I've never been incapacitated before. So I have to start doing all this physical therapy. I go from a wheelchair to um, a walker. My brother steals a wheelchair. If you work at Valley Hospital, it's since been returned. But um, I, uh, And my mom comes up to Vegas to visit me, and she says something very similar to my uncle. You make a mess wherever you go. And I would just love to tell you guys that I'd stop drinking after that. It's Vegas, man. Vegas is the problem. I got to go. And I had met a friend of my brother's. Um, Off we go to San Diego because he's it. You know, geographic one after another after another. And I put myself into a situation in San Diego with people that are the real deal, no joke. Um, Did I create bitterness? Did I cause jealousy? Did I do any of those things? Where did I set the ball rolling that later put me in a position to be very, very hurt? I got beaten up there within an inch of my life. And I got on my knees for the first time in a very long time, and I said to God, God, if you get me back to Vegas, because sometime, somehow I still had a storage. You know how you just have pods of stuff all over the country? That's what I had. And um, I 
begged God, just please get me back there and, and I'll change. Because I tell you what had happened. My folks from the Midwest, as I said, one of my brothers is a severe asthmatic, so they moved to Phoenix. My folks hired this guy to be my babysitter. Great guy. But he's too drunk to be my babysitter. So he starts telling us about Alcoholics Anonymous. He's in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous when I'm a very young kid. He plants a seed that I don't know that I'm going to need later on. But he protected me. He had a small problem with armed robbery, so maybe he'd be gone once, a, once in a while. But I remember he protected me with those raunchy boys, right, that I was growing up with. And so I'm circling back to San Diego, and I say, um, God, please just get me there. And made a little way late in Phoenix, begged my mom for help. She helps me out. And, um, you know, that was August of 1991. You guys already know I'm not sober. I promise again, get me out of this one, and I'm, I'm going to change. And it's just off to the races. Um, at that last time, I was working in a different hotel, and it was, it was starting to shut down. It was, stop, it was starting to stop working, and I didn't really know what was wrong because alcohol had always been my friend. Because when you're drinking at, at the time, how I like to drink, and I bet some of you like to drink, at that age, you can recover pretty quick. You know, I'm still in my late 20s. I can bounce back. I got it going on. I can still wear the shorty shorts and all that stuff. But um, my family was gone. They'd had it. The episode with the car and the moving all over and the getting beat up. And I always thought it was somebody else. So I start think, I having these consequences, and people don't want anything to do with me. And I start thinking about my old babysitter, Joe. And I'm thinking, it can't be Alcoholics Anonymous. That'd be really way overcorrecting, right? And uh, I, uh, God, please not that. So I start going to meetings through my own volition. And I thought, oh, it's overcorrecting. Oh, my God. There's people like these nice people all dressed up, shiny faces. And I thought, I, I don't want this. And they would talk about, if you want what we have. And I didn't know what you have. I just didn't want what I had. I just wanted you guys to make the consequences to go away. And I had the good fortune of meeting some people that didn't mollycoddle me. They told me the truth about me. And they said, we're not going to chase you around and have you do the program. Uh, do it or don't. If you're not done, go out and drink. I said, that's rude. This is Alcoholics Anonymous, right? And um, I just start diving in. I, I had a small apartment, and all of a sudden I'd go out with these people, and there'd be a piece of pie or what have you. I didn't have anything. And... I was six months sober, and I go to a retreat at Lake Mead, um, which is a man-made lake outside of Las Vegas. And I'm with my people in my home group, and I run across this guy. Now, I'm no shrinking violet, as you guys can tell, but this guy was so rude, so obnoxious. I thought, I do not like that guy. We were married 20 years in September, and, um, <laughs> you know, it's... Um, you know, I was afraid. I was afraid of him. You know why? Because he was good to me. It wasn't all the shenanigans that I was doing before I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, he had a son, four-year-old son, and I'm not able to have children. And I was threatened by his ex-wife because she can do something that I can't do. And, you know, all of my self-centered fear was off and running, and somebody in the program told me that I had to tell him the truth that I was in fear. I can't show my underbelly and tell somebody I'm in fear. I gotta put my look good on, right? And I started le learning from the men and women in the program how to show up in my own life. Because you know what? I run when it gets hard. I gotta go. And this guy had a sponsor at the time, and um, the guy told 
my husband Bob to break up with me, and he did. I thought, nobody breaks up with me. I'd said the way around. And, uh, but you know what that guy gave me that gift is how to sponsor people because I'm nobody's higher power. I don't know what you should do. It's not recommended for somebody to get involved with somebody else within six months, but that is my story, and I stayed sober through your help in Alcoholics Anonymous. And you know what? If, if Bob would have taken that direction, I would have missed my soulmate. I got to seek God. I got to seek wise counsel in here with long timers. If you've got that experience, I need you to be able to tell me so I can hear your heart to my heart, not what you think I should do. Um, so it was two five-year-olds living together, and I would, uh, the, his son actually had more sobriety than either one of us, you know. <laughs> so he got a new sponsor, and he hooked back up with me, and um, his sponsor um, at the time, he's passed now, uh, his name's Wino. And he'd rub his hands like this and he'd say, good thoughts plus good actions cannot produce bad results. If you don't have a program behind your own door, you don't have a program. And I told you guys, my dad died unexpectedly, so I always had that big fear. So they'd say, don't leave mad. Well, I had to go back in from the garage all the time because I'm going to leave mad. I got to go. And when I was about uh, five years sober, I was still working at that casino, and I got um, very, very ill. There was a meningitis uh, outbreak at the casino I worked in, which I didn't want anybody to know because it affects tourism, right? And uh, <laughs> anyway, I uh, got a started having a bunch of problems with my spinal cord. So I'm going back and forth to UCLA. I don't have a very good job at the time, and we're amassing ridiculous amount of debt. Plus, I don't, I'm sure there's no one in Seattle that does this, but I've done it, and in Las Vegas, sometimes you live over your means. Right? <laughs> and I was buying things to impress people that I didn't really know. And all of a sudden, it's just going on and on and on. And uh, at the time, my husband loses his job. And then these people in AA would say, just turn it over. And I'd be like, oh, yes, I, thank you. I hadn't thought of that, right? And um, <laughs> so there's a guy, um, Clint H., from Los Angeles, um, that would come and pick Bob up at UCLA, and he'd say to him, I know you think your story is going to be better if she dies, but let's just go to a meeting. And we just kept, and I started getting better. You know, I'm, I lost my job in the casino business because I couldn't return to medical, from medical leave. All of a sudden, I get offered a job after I've recovered from all this, and we've got all this debt, and I don't know what I'm going to do, a job in the field that I went to school for that I was going to quit. And I didn't know how to do it, but you guys helped me to do it. And, um, you know, I travel all around the world for that job today, and they trust me. When I first got there, here was what my employee review would look like. Does not have a filter. That's what my boss would say to me. And um, doesn't play well with others. Kind of looks like your report card, right? And... Um, so we're going along, and uh, my husband ends up with just unbelievable, unbelievable job. And I was at uh, a retreat, a women's retreat in Malibu, almost three years ago. And I, uh, you know how you know when something's wrong? You can feel it, something's going on. And my husband had had some health problems. Now, um, at the time when I met him, he's four years sober. So at that time, three years ago, he would have been 23 years sober. And uh, he doesn't answer the phone. And it's around uh, Founder's Day. And I can't really be in the tree, so I call somebody that uh, we 
in Vegas to go check on me. No, 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 he's fine. We saw him at Founders Day today. Now, my husband told me he was at Costco with one of our friends. Costco and Farmers Day is not the Founders Day is not the same thing. So I I get back, and my husband, when I left, had 23 years. And when I got home, he was out. And there's an old timer in our community that says it better than anybody I've ever heard. He said, active alcoholism in a sober home is like a wild beast loose and there's no doors. And the man that I love and grew up with, I no longer knew. I'm telling you, I don't have medication history. He was out on medication and I got to go. That's it. This is a sober household. And somehow I was able to say, like somebody told me when I was newly married, you can do that if that's what you'd like to do, but you cannot live here. I knew at that moment, you know how it says, I have to be willing to go to any length to stay sober. Um, I didn't really know what that meant until that moment. And I don't wish that on anybody. There was so much judgment in our community. It was hard. to. I felt like my skin was being pulled off. Um, and you know what I had to learn from that was uh, standing at the greeter door with, at the time, 19, 20 years sober, standing at the door greeting, shaking hands to people that were throwing me under the bus, because I didn't want to drink. Um, alcoholism is an ugly, ugly disease. And I thought I was going to have to go. And I sought very wise counsel. And I want to say that again because I'm really careful who I take direction from. Because as an alcoholic, if I follow a non alcoholics or a heavy drinker's direction, I can get in a hole. The buggy's going to be in the ditch because they can do things that I might not be able to do. And here's the direction that I got. God forbid if the roles were reversed, would my husband stand by me? And um, looking back, you know, I've had some other health problems, and he did stand by me, and I said that I thought that he would. And the direction I got was, then what you really have is a sick friend which the book tells me exactly what to do with a sick friend, right? And um, was I willing to make a commitment to the long period of reconstruction ahead? The book talks about that. You know, it's not quitting when it gets hard or, um, you know, he's two years sober now. Um, as a result of that, it set in place some dominoes of losing a lot of material things that I thought I needed to be okay. Because growing up in the back, growing up in the area that I did, the lovely Murder Vale, is uh, I think if I've got the house, the career, and all of this, then I'm okay. Um, he, he lost an unbelievable job. We sold our dream home. Um, I sold another house, and I didn't know how I was going to be able to do it. But I did it through great sponsorship and standing at that door. And what I realized is how fortunate I am that, um, especially somebody that had time, is able to come back through that door. That that door does not always swing both ways. Um, and it's my responsibility as an alcoholic to, to welcome somebody, whether they're brand, brand new or coming back again. Um, it's just amazing to me that uh, if I would have done the easier, it, I don't know why that I always want to cleave toward the easier, softer way. I'm out. I would have missed it if I would have done that. I'm not going to tell you the long period of reconstruction ahead is a, a lot of fun all the time. It's not. But I know without a shadow of a doubt to this date for 22 years, 
I've been able to get through some hard stuff sober without drinking. Even if I want some relief somehow. Um, you know, I uh, have had to grow up behind my workplace of, you know, practicing the principles in all my affairs. We were talking about that at dinner, and I don't know, that's been the slowest area for me. You know, we just had our fiscal year in, and here's the review that I get today, thanks to you guys. Makes a difference in the office. You know, brings a lot of camaraderie. And here's my personal favorite. Requires little to no supervision. Really? <laughs> Requires little to no supervision. That's pretty good. And, you know, I... Um, I think about my time in Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, I, I thought it was the worst thing in the world, and it's ended up being the best thing. I, I think we're coming to to a close, but I um, I want to tell you a little bit about um, Joe, the the babysitter, the guy who hired to paint the house and um, became my babysitter, and. So I'm around a year sober, and um, I want to tell him that his efforts weren't in vain, even if he wasn't sober or what have you, and he has a very unusual last name. So my mom said, oh, I know where he is. He's up in Prescott, which is north of Phoenix. And so we ring him up, and my mom gets a hold of um, a subsequent wife of his, and uh, she says, Joe murdered his former wife and then turned the gun on himself. And um, there's a place in Las Vegas where you put your sobriety date on a mug. And so my husband had mine 11591, thanks, Joe. And I always think about that as although he um, didn't stay sober, he planted a seed as my babysitter that I was able to find you guys. You know, I haven't been to treatment. I'm testimony that you can get and stay sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, I, don't know, I don't know any other way um, other than to just stay here even when it hurts. And um, I thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.